I'm going to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight. We're um, muted. Okay, yep. Yeah, if everybody can mute yourself while we do this, uh, we're going to have a wonderful presenter tonight, which you all have had opportunity to meet prior to uh, starting our presentation. Uh, with that being said, what I'd like you also to do in the chat box is introduce yourself and tell us what one of your favorite meals is from just using something in the plant family, okay? Uh, if you don't have something in the plant family, go to the fruit family, just to kind of see if your chat is working to make sure that all those things is functioning. And with that being said, at this time, I'm going to introduce Jim Chatfield, better known as Chatman Do, and he's gonna talk about bad plants and all their guys, part one. Jim, if you wanna share your screen? I will. Thank you. Uh, so let's see, share. And I trust that you can see my screen, bad plants one and two, is that, th is that correct? Yes, I can see it. Everybody's good. So I'm gonna go ahead and put myself on mute. And Jim, All right, so away. I thought this might be a fun thing to talk about. I, I, I did a presentation on some pieces of this a little while ago. And obviously the term bad, I mean, I should put it in, in, uh, in, print, in uh, quotes marks up there because obviously it all has to do with uh, the particular perspective uh, that one comes from. I mean, we all tend to be speciesist in the sense that we care more about our species than other species. We, we try to be, have a broad view of nature and that sort of thing, but by nature, we are a little bit subjective about the fact that, that we tend to be more worried about our species than we are about a particular ant or a particular bacterium. Uh, so the fact is, when we say the word bad, it depends on what our perspective is, but, but that's fine. I mean, we can uh, admit our biases and think about it from different perspectives. So when I originally put uh, my bad plant thing together, I considered some different ways uh, in which uh, we might think of a plant as being bad. From our perspective, for example, a weed would be something bad, an unwanted plant. That's a, a really as much of a definition as there really is of a weed. There's no such thing as a weed in nature. It's an unwanted plant by somebody. And it may be an unwanted plant to one person and not another person. And so that's always part of the issue that comes into play. But, you know, weeds would certainly be something that somebody would think of as a bad plant. I have a couple of examples up here in the left-hand corner and up in here. These are plants that are plant pathogens. So a plant pathogen causes infectious plant disease. You know, we, when we think of infectious plant disease, for example, we tend to think of something like uh, a fungus that causes a plant disease, the, the fungus that causes uh, tomato anthracnose, or the oomycete, which is a fungus-like organism that uh, caused late blight of potato and had played such a role in the Irish potato famine, which is something we can think about here with the 17th coming up and uh, St. Patrick's Day. So a plant pathogen causes infectious disease of a plant, which in, 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 in a sense, which by definition is something that is interfering with the metabolism of a plant. So it turns out that in addition to certain fungi, certain bacteria, certain oomycetes, which are things like the phytophthora that cause late blight of potato, uh, certain nematodes, certain, th those are considered plant pathogens, but there's actually certain plants that are considered plant pathogens and not just on the basis of the fact that they compete with each other or even that they produce chemicals that damage others. There are actually plants that will send little suckers down into other plants and cause them to not do as well metabolically. And so an example of that is the true mistletoes and you're seeing that up here in the dwarf mistletoes that we'll come and talk about later. And that's a mistletoe in a tr another kind of tree. And it's sending little suckers down into the plant. This is daughter, which you may have seen uh, in a vegetable garden or along stream sides. And that's, an, a, that's a, a plant. And the plant, you know, back here, you're actually looking at Japanese knotweed, which is considered a significant invasive weed. But this is daughter. And you notice that the daughter doesn't look like it produces a lot of chlorophyll. It does produce a tiny little bit but the body of that plant is actually tan colored because it doesn't photosynthesize hardly at all. Where does it get its food? It gets its food by sending little suckers down into the plant and extracting uh, water and minerals from the vascular system of the plant in question. Now we might say this is a good plant because it's uh, 
a parasite of a what we would consider a blad plant, a weed, but you know, again, it, it's all a matter of whose ox is being gored. Here is an example of a, a plant that is a plant pathogen that sends its little structure called a hostorium, a hostorium down into the tissue. And so this is the vascular system. These are little vascular bundles in a uh, monocot plant. And so the plant pathogen is sending its, the, the plant that is a plant pathogen uh, is sending little hostoria down into, to steal the water and minerals from this other plant. So that would be considered a plant that is a plant parasite. There's other ways of thinking. And so, you know, if you're an insect, then you might be uh, consider a bad plant to be a insectivorous plant. And I'm actually going to use an example of that. I mean, typically human beings don't think of insectivorous plants as being uh, bad, but if you're an insect, it is. And so here's a little fly that's about to be caught up in a sundew plant. And so again, uh, all these, there's all, uh, my real goal to the whole presentation is how interesting and fascinating nature is. And it, it just is, it's just, you know, there's so many different ways that organisms interact and it's wonderful to know all about that. And I'm gonna give you an example early on that'll really get that there. And here, of course, we will we'll say that these are an unwanted play on a weed that is covering these people. I love this as a, uh, with the flyer that goes with this program. This is a great thing that you guys dug up. So that's kind of cool. All right, so as we broaden the discussion of what I'll call plant on plant crime, uh, there are many examples. There is a dwarf mistletoe and now dwarf mistletoe is a really significant problem on conifers out west. So on spruces, on pines, on on uh, furs, uh, these dwarf mistletoes, and you may have seen this if you travel out west, they don't have as much chlorophyll as the true mistletoes we show, showed before. They are sending suckers down into that plant and become quite a, uh, quite a significant parasite on, on, on conifers out west. So that's a picture of a dwarf mistletoe. And this is from a picture I took uh, uh, probably in northern New Mexico. It could have been in Utah. Uh, at any rate. Uh, Oops. You know, another, another broadening the discussion of just kind of some of the interesting things. Allelopathy. By allelopathy is a fascinating thing. I don't know why that keeps shifting like that. I have a new computer here now that I'm no longer with Ohio State after retiring. But uh, biochemical allelo allelopathy is all about a plant, a plant on plant crime in the sense that it's a plant that produces chemicals that hinder other plants. The most classic example we always use in horticulture is a black walnut that produces chemicals in pretty much all the parts of a black walnut tree, but especially in root systems, roots, for example. And that chemical juglone that's in that black walnut plant, if it contacts certain very sensitive plants, will keep those other plants from growing. And the, the most classical example of that is tomatoes. We actually get walnut wilt. You can get walnut wilt or you can get tomato wilt for a lot of things, but one of them is from those chemicals of that juglone produced by the walnut plant. So that teaches us oftentimes how far reaching the roots of black walnut trees are. Maybe 50 feet, the tree may be 50 feet away from your tomato garden, but if those roots of that walnut tree are going over there, uh, they produce chemicals that'll cause that walnut plant too. So there, you know, there's another way that, you know, we could consider that a bad plant if we want the tomatoes. Uh, I thought it would also be fun. And eventually probably next week, next time we do this, not next week, the, the there's plant movie monsters feed me. So we have a lot of fun movie things that are obviously not real, but are kind of fun uh, with the little shop of horrors, with the day of the triffids, with, uh, <clears throat> invasion of the body snatchers, uh, attack of the killer tomatoes. Those are fanciful ideas of bad plants that are actually eating people. But, you know, there, it's, uh, there's a lot of fun associated with all that. There's the allelopathy with the walnut tree. This is a really interesting example, which I think I may have brought up in one of our POW things before. But this is a, a little plant, monotropa. Uh, it's called Indian pipe. And... Uh, Many people think of it as being a parasite of plants. It doesn't produce hardly any of its own food through photosynthesis. So it isn't green. Here's its flowers, its, its stems, leaves, and flowers. It's clearly a plant. I mean, it's got flowers. It's one of the higher plants, but it doesn't produce hardly any food. And uh, how does it get its food? 
Uh, I was always taught in the very early days that it gets its food from trees, and that's not quite true. Not exactly true. So we'll talk about that eventually, and it's pretty fascinating. Here's some kudzu. Here's a bad plant that is producing allergies in people. Obviously, the goldenrod is not a bad plant in the sense of it's a perfectly wonderful plant in nature. It just happens to be something that we may not like if we suffer from allergies. All right, so we have all these different things that we're going to talk about. And also, uh, you know, earlier, I mean, the first question I got tonight was, oh, so you're going to talk about in invasive plants. That really wasn't my general intention to talk about invasive plants. I mean, there are a couple of examples I was using, but remember, this is one and two. And so we could launch out into a whole thing about invasive plants. Ilanthus would be an example. Calorie pears would be an example. Uh, we could do that. And I certainly uh, enjoy talking about that. It's one of the most fascinating aspects of our whole understanding of nature is not only invasive plants, but invasive uh, plant pathogens, invasive, uh, uh, invasive insects, invasive uh, all kinds of different organisms, invasive viruses, invasive, you know, on and on and on. It's really quite, I mean, we obviously uh, know that we have an invasive virus, the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is, uh, which is the uh, operative virus in uh, COVID-19 disease, uh, you know, it didn't originate here. And uh, so it's a coronavirus, uh, which originated and came from, uh, uh, from animals and which came from, uh, you know, some, some re recombination of genes with the viruses involved. And so, the, you know, all those things can come into play and it becomes quite a big deal. And I said, and, and so I said, and then there's wicked and killer plants. I mean, there's plants that will kill us because they produce toxins that kill us. Wicked plants, you know, you could talk about certain plants that way in terms of their effects on us. The hazards of horticulture, the rose gardener disease that's caused by a fungus can be found on, uh, that can be inoculated into us by the thorns of roses. So, you know, we have a million little stories that we can eventually tell in these sessions and it'll be fun. And of course, weeds. Although for today, weeds, I'm not gonna focus on weeds, probably not gonna talk about weeds too much even the next time, but you know, obviously weeds would be considered to be plant on plant crime. They would be considered to be bad plants from a certain perspective. But again, it depends on what your perspective actually is. But before all of that, and this is in the line of what I really want to, to focus on. And after I get done with this little example that I came up with, with a new book I've been reading, uh, my wife, Laura, uh, mentioned that she'd heard a podcast about this book, and uh, so I got it, and it's really an interesting book. And so uh, I want to use this as an example because I, what I really want to get at with this is to, to really recognize all the different ways that things exist in, in nature, that, and it's really subjective. I mean, uh, in the sense of uh, something that we might think bad is not bad from nature's perspective that uh, you know every plant has pathogens for example every and they're just as you know they're co-equal in nature between the the plant that we're concerned about i mean there's nothing abnormal about parasitism i mean parasitism is part of the way nature works but at any rate let's uh, there's this neat new book ken thompson uh, it's i guess 2018 or maybe a little earlier uh, Darwin's Most Wonderful Plants. And the interesting thing, a tour of his botanical legacy, one of the interesting things that Ken Thompson says in this book is, most people know of Darwin relative to origin of species, the descent of man, they, what, you know, things that he might have had to say about animals and humans relative to natural selection and evolution. But he was very fascinated by plants. And in fact, after the 1859 uh, origin of species and following up with the descent of man, I mean, really, and you know, and he studied a lot of different animals, barnacles and all kinds of other things. But really, he spent them a large portion of his life as as, as a scientist slash naturalist uh, with what was going on with plants, and that they, it plants played very prominently into the theory of evolution and natural selection. And one of the things that he loved were carnivorous plants. And so I, I, I'll come back to Darwin in a minute, but carnivorous plants are really interesting. And the reason I bring them up, obviously they're not, we would never tend to think of carnivorous plants as bad because we like to grow them and they're very interesting and you can find them down in the bogs in Ohio, some of them. 
Uh, so we don't think of them as bad plants, but of course, if, you, if, we, if we broaden our perspective, well, let's say if I'm an insect or if I'm a fly, boy, I'm going to really be worried about the fly traps. You know, so, but I've used carnivorous plants as a really kind of cool example. That is, there's an example used in this book about Darwin and plants that is really, really interesting in terms of us learning to think about the broadness of nature and the many different interactions of nature and the different ways to look at them. So let's talk about carnivorous plants a minute. So I'm gonna give a little ba background in there. And of course we can learn how to grow them and all that kind of stuff too. But I wanna use them as an example of some of the interesting ways that natural selection and evolution works. And let's talk about this a little bit. So carnivorous plants are plants that derive some or most of their nutrients from trapping and consuming animals or protozoans, typically insects and other arthropods. However, carnivorous plants generate energy from photosynthesis. So let's think about that for a minute. So carnivorous plants, <clears throat> typically, in fact, I think all of them that I know of, photosynthesized. You know, they have green tissue. They produce their own food. They, they're, you know, bona fide autotrophs. They are able to take carbon dioxide and water and the presence of this wonderful pigment, pigment chlorophyll that uh, takes carbon dioxide and water and the presence of, presence of an energy source like the sun or a, or, a, or a good light with the right wavelengths and, and ultimately produces a, something that has that carbon and oxygen and uh, hydrogen in it. So carbon dioxide and water, they produce a carbon hydrogen and oxygen component called a carbohydrate, which is basically the basic food stuff of life relative to, to, or to energy that is used to drive cells of all organisms on earth. And so carnivorous plants photosynthesize and they actually generally, and this is something I hadn't even thought through until I started looking into this a little bit more and understood it a little bit better. Carnivorous plants usually grow in areas of reasonably high light, you know, because they photosynthesize and so they high light is a natural thing as it is for many plants. So what is it that they're, you know, why are they actually also eating insects? They typically grow in places with low nitrogen and in many cases, low phosphorus. And don't worry about this proto carnivorous plant and all these other details. I mean, there's obviously all these variations. You know, there's some that are more, uh, you know, the, where it's more and more, more or less important in terms of their ability to digest these things. And so, and what what that comes into is there's the carnivorous plants evolved widely in nature, and this is perfect that we had that earlier discussion. This is perfect. So, uh, carnivorous plants developed in 14 plant families, over a thousand species in 14 plant families. So we all know that plant families are groups of related genera and genera are, are, are genuses, are, are, are groups of plants of, of related species. So a group of related species is a genus, a group of related genuses is a family and a group of related families is an order. So, uh, Five plant orders, 14 families, both monocots and dicots. Monocots would be, you know, things like palms and, uh, and sedges and grasses and lilies. Uh, single cotyledonary leaf instead of two in the dicots. So that's really interesting. So carnivorous plants evolved in a whole bunch of different genetic lines. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, carnivorous plants are all really closely related to each other. There are some that are related to each other, but they developed in a whole bunch of different lines of, of uh, genetic evolution. So then let's bring in, so that's important. So it's important to keep that in mind. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about here is this whole evolutionary aspect, how it relates to these different adaptations organisms have. And then and just to blow our minds about all these different things where I'm gonna use this example in from one of the books that uh, is highlighted in this book about Darwin's wonderful plants. Okay, so here's Darwin. And here is a great quote that I think is really a, a wonderful quote. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed, in, breathed into a few forms or into one 
and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being involved. Charles Darwin wrote that in 1859, or at least published it in 1859. There is grandeur in this view of life. And so he was trying to get people to get that, you know, we're not talking here about some weird thing that is just, you know, how can we think so differently than we thought before? There is grandeur in this, all this wonderful thing. So, so in uh, Ken Thompson's book, you know, he points out, and I've, I've read parts of all of these books before. I, I, I've read some of them when I got a degree in botany. I read a lot of them because Dan Herms used to have all of these in his uh, in his office all lined up together and so these are a bunch of uh, you know this isn't the you know this is, Darwin wrote a lot of other things including of course the origin of species that sent a man but here are some of his plant books on the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects and on the good effects of intercrossing on the movements and habits of climbing plants was another book on the variation of animals and plants under domestication another book insectivorous plants and I highlighted that because that's the, an example we're going to use in a minute. The effects of cross fertilization in the vegetable kingdom, the different forms of flowers on plants of the same species, the power and movement in plants. Now, these were all things that Darwin, you know, books that he wrote over a 20 year period and were things he'd been thinking about for 40, 50 years. All right. So then we have our carnivorous plant thing. These killer plants. So that's how they would be bad, but, you know, to insects. So they attract, they catch, they kill and they digest insects, typically developing in poor nutrient soil. Excuse me, that was my phone. I shouldn't have done that. I'll turn the sound off. They typically develop in poor nutrient soil. Very important to keep in mind. There's something that they need that they're not getting. They can produce their carbohydrate by photosynthesis, but plants need other minerals. They need nitrogen, they need phosphorus compounds. They need other minerals as well. These, uh, uh, these insectivorous plants, as we said, were in a, a group, widely distinct, different plant groups, widely distributed everywhere, all continents except Antarctica. There's more carnivorous plants in the US than any other country, as far as that's concerned. So examples would be like the Venus flytrap, uh, the sundews, you know, the, you know, the wonderful sundews and the flytraps and the bladder warts, which are really incredible. Some of these bladder warts, pitcher plants, you know, on and on, all these different fantastic plants. And they have different kinds of trapping mechanisms. They have pitfall traps that trap prey in a rolled leaf that contains a, po a pool of digestive enzymes or bacteria, flypaper tracks that use a sticky mucilage to catch things, snap traps with rapid leaf movement, some of the fastest movements in nature to trap these things like that Venus fly trap right there, bladder traps that suck in prey with a bladder that generates an internal, all these kind of different traps that are, are catching insects. And then what happens here, they, they, they need a way to, uh, they need enzymes, digestive enzymes, sometimes bacteria that help with that process, because what they need to do is to get that insect, you know, they need to get that organic matter uh, into a form that they can use for their own digestion because they don't have enough nitrogen that they get from the soil. And many of them really don't even have roots. All right, bladder warts. Linnaeus named this particular bladder wart, ultra, uh, Utricularia vulcaris, the common bladder wart, uh, you know, people didn't know what they were all about in the 16 and 1700s and before that, but they finally began to learn that uh, these weren't just flotation devices. They were little things to trap in, uh, insects and then digest them. Darwin noticed these traps shut 100 times faster than Venus fly traps that shut incredibly fast. So, you know, all these people are figuring out all these cool things. All right, so Linnaeus, for example, the guy that gave us the Latin binomials that we started to eat this evening's program with. So Linnaeus uh, brought a pitcher plant. Uh, when, when, when somebody brought a pitcher plant to Linnaeus in the mid 1700s, he placed it in the genus Nepenthes, which is the Greek without grief because it was so beautiful. So he, he gave the name of it from the Greek that he made into the Latin. Uh, it's so beautiful. So we'll, we'll use the words that would mean without grief. And listen to this story. This is not the main story we're going to tell here, but this is this story. So there's, in these pictures, there's some that have multiple pictures. And bats live in, the, in this pictures in this Nepenthes Raja, which is in Borneo. 
It's the largest carnivorous plant in the world. It can store a half gallon of liquid in one pitcher, which includes bat guano. The second pitcher is for the bat to live. So the bat lives in one pitcher. He collects the insect, you know, the, the insects are, are caught up in this, this other one and these digestive enzymes. It's a whole ecosystem that is going on with that. But listen to Darwin now as we go into his example in a minute. During subsequent years, whenever I had leisure, I, subsequent after the origin of the species, I pursued my experiments and my book on insectivorous plants was published in 1875, 16 years after my first observations. The fact that a plant should secrete when properly excited a fluid containing an acid and ferment closely analogous to the digestive fluid of an animal was a remarkable discovery. And so he was really thrilled by this. One of the most wonderful plants in the world, the Venus flytrap, but on sundews, I care more about Drosera than the origin of species. You know, it's just really kind of an amazing, amazing thing. There's a lot of good quotes here. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. These random mutations making you adapted to the particular change that occurs. All right. So now let's look at this grandeur in this view of life, this interesting example that we're gonna use uh, uh, that is talked about in this book by Thompson. So these insectivorous plants in well-lit habitats, low in minerals, but there's insects around. And this, this occurred many, many different ways. Thousand plus species have adapted glands that add digestive enzymes. But this other example, is one that is really interesting relative to us thinking about how adaptation occurs and how it occurred in a lot of different ways because this example is different from most of the others. It's a plant called Rorigula. So here's Rorigula. It's uh, also called uh, uh, stick, you know, stick plant, stick, yeah, stick plant. Uh, it's not quite right. Stick something, stick plant. Sticky plant, and it, it is, it's really kind of interesting because uh, you can see that it's sticky here, but it doesn't have any enzymes for digestion. Almost all of the things like sundews and Venus flytraps and pitcher plants that we think about, they have their enzymes that the plant produces that allow it to digest. But this rorigula stuff, it doesn't have any of those enzymes. So what the heck's going on? It has sticky glandular hairs like these other carnivorous plants. It doesn't have, it doesn't have enzymes to digest them. So how does this all work? Well, there's a little plant bug and plant bug is another term that we need to become aware of. When you say bug, it doesn't equal insect. I mean, we obviously, that is what many people would say, but a true plant bug is a certain kind of sucking insect. I mean, there's a lot of different species of it, but there's, they're sucking insects, it's, they suck sap from plants. And there is a genus that occurs in South Africa along with this Rorigula plant. And uh, they're in the genus Pameridia. They're specifically associated with Rorigula. They eat trapped insects and then they excrete. So they eat the tra trapped insects, digest them. They produce the digestive enzymes. Then they excrete them. And then those minerals are available for Rorigula. So Rorigula, is different from other types of carnivorous plants in that it has no enzymes, but it has enzyme, but it has the digested, it gets the digested minerals because there were insects that did that. So that is something that we call mutualism. So there's a whole bunch of things that are colloquially called uh, symbiotic. And many people think of symbiotic, and it's one way to use the term, as being something that is kind of a plus plus, both group, both organisms in a, in, a, in a symbiosis are benefited, plus plus. And that's only one type of symbiosis. Symbiosis basically is just in plant, is just organisms that interact with each other. So a plant pathogen that uh, like Phytophthora that, that uh, parasitizes a tomato plant or a potato plant, also a tomato, and potato plant that caused late blighted potato you know, that's symbiosis. It just doesn't happen to be a mutualistic symbiosis. It is a parasitism, which is a type of symbiosis. But mutualism is when both organisms are benefited. But at any rate, let's look at this example a little more. So rorigula from the rorit, roritus, meaning dewy, dew stick, yeah, that's the name of it. So another a term for this plant is dew stick or fly bush. And so it has that sticky 
but it doesn't have a way to digest it. So it uses those. So you know, what happens is that those insects do it for them. Linnaeus named it back in 1764. Darwin was really interested in it in the 1870s. And, and uh, all right. So the stickiness is from a resin capturing some of the largest insects of any carnivorous plants. Unlike other carnivores, the resin is waterproof and desiccation resistance adapted to the wet winters and dry summers of its South African habitat. I misspelled African there. Uh, and the point I bring, bring this up, it, it goes into a whole nother direction of thinking about the adaptation here, but it is different in the sense that, uh, you know, that it's got this waterproof and desiccation resistant resins, which isn't very typical of some of these sticky plants, but it's because they have dry summers and they can't, they don't want to lose the water. And it just is, it's another way of us to keep in mind but it, what happened there with this plant that turned out to be insectivorous is very different from what happens with other insectivorous plants because it was an adaptation because of the environment that was there, which is really the key. It is the one that is most adaptable to change in an environment. Sticky, but unlike sun, hun, sundews and other carnivores that have mucilages that are mostly water, Origula creates an almost indestructible armor. Okay, so how do the Pameridia plant bugs handle this and why don't they stick to it? You know, okay, so you have these plant bugs. Well, why don't they stick to the stuff? Why don't they stick to the mucilages that are in Rorigula? Why, you know, they're going to eat these other insects that are then going to provide the digestive juices that are going to be used by the Rorigula. But why don't they, why, you know, wh why don't the plant bugs get stuck in this stuff? Because Pameridia cuticles, the cuticles of this plant bug, have a thick layer of grease and special hairs on their feet that allow them to avoid sticking. And that's what I mean by the grandeur in this view of life. What an incredible uh, adaptation. So they are able to, to move around and eat these insects because they don't stick because of the spe special adaptations that work for them in the development of this uh, mutualistic symbiosis. So then you might say, well, what happens though? I mean, you know, plant bugs, take juices from plants. Isn't that damaging? Yeah, we have a lot of plant bugs that we consider to be insect pests of plants because they're sucking out water and minerals from the vascular system of the plant. So that's not gonna be a mutualistic symbiosis, is it? That's not gonna be a plus plus. Is it a mutualism gone bad? What happens if these plant bugs get carried away and suck too many juices, T-O-O -O it should be, from the Rulidula? Then enters Cinema marlothii crab spiders. So these crab spiders feed on trapped prey and plant bugs and add to the nitrogenous feces the plant needs. So the Cinema marlothii is a, a, another component in this whole ecosystem that, uh, that allows for the plant bugs to suck saps and provide what the plant needs, which is the rodigula plant needs, which is these digested enzymes from the dead plants. But if it gets out of hand and the plant bugs are sucking too many saps, it tends to work out in general because the, 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 the evolution of and the natural selection involved in this working out also includes this other organism that comes into play that kind of is a, a, a biological control of that system. And, you know, obviously there's more and more of these. It goes to, you know, from the tertiary to quaternary components of these systems. But ain't nature grand? Isn't this grandeur in this view of life? I use this example, and you might say, well, what is this about bad plants? We're just talking about insectivorous plants. But my point here really is plants and nature and all these interactions there is great grandeur to it. Understanding it, being aware of it, relating it to other people. It's a wonderful, wonderful world that you're never going to get bored of and you'll learn until the day that you to the day that you become compost one day. All right, Lola. Are you there, Lola? Is there anybody yes, out I'm there? here. What can I do for so you? The question is, now that we're about to move into a new arena, which is going to be starting to talk about plant pathogens and especially about uh, uh, plants as plant pathogens, all that sort of stuff, I want to give people an opportunity to make comments, to ask questions. 
or to even say something like, hey, why don't you just spend all your, the rest of your time today talking about uh, taxonomy, all these plant names. I just can't get enough of it. I got to hear more and more of these Latin names. Or maybe a person that's more rational would say something like, why don't we talk about invasive plants? Or maybe you'll say, get on to something else. Let's, let's find out. Okay. Let's unmute everybody okay. and find out if there's any comments. All right, they can, they can actually unmute themselves. So if you have a question or a comment, please unmute yourself. Or a Ask. preference of what we'll do next. Right. So any feedback? Chris, I think you had something in the chat box. Would you like to start with you? Unmute yourself. Chris, you have to unmute yourself. There you okay. go. Can you hear me okay? Now we can. Yeah, Thank you. We can even see you. So my question was about, um, I, I took a field trip to Cranberry Bog by Buckeye Lake, you know, in near the Columbus area one year, and there were a lot of pitcher plants, and I think sundews down there, too. And I just wondered if, um, you know, the, the insecta, in, insectivorates, did I say that right? Yeah. Insectivorates, if, if uh, their development has a lot to do with that type of an environment, like a boggy environment, um, or yeah. how much it does have to do with? Low nitrogen. Lo that is low, low nitrogen. It is. Yeah, there's <laughs> not very much available, available nitrogen. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that, you know, there's an alkaline and an acidic environment that goes along with that it, it, does that come into play with their development as well sure i mean sure i mean they're, they're different plants have different uh, uh tolerances of alkaline versus acidic uh and so there's, you know there's just a whole wide range of that thing one thing that you'll tend to see frequently in addition to insectivorous plants is that you'll see a lot of plants in the Aracaceae in bogs. Cranberries, for example, are in the genus Vaccinium, which is in the Aracaceae, which is the, which is what is the, the prototypical acid-loving plant. So rhododendrons and azaleas and blueberries and cranberries, they all love acid conditions. And they do very good in bog environments, which are oftentimes very acid. I think the difference, and I'm, I may I may have this wrong, but the difference between a bog and a uh, a fin is whether they're acidic or uh, alkaline, That's and so I bogs started, tend yeah. to be so bogs tend to be acidic, and so you'll get a lot of acid-loving plants. So that that uh, hydrogen ion concentration, the thing that makes things uh, acidic or not acidic, and how that relates to availability of minerals and nutrients, which is the big key as to whether what you know an acid-loving plant is typically a plant that. Uh, uh, Certain minerals, like for example, iron and uh, for example, iron and manganese, are oftentimes bound up to other minerals uh, in acid conditions, and so that's why we have problems with those acid-loving plants if they're in alkaline situations. So, so that you know that all plays into whether a plant can be can do well in a particular environment. So bogs are acid; they're low nitrogen, those kinds of things, and that all then relates to what plants do well there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great because you know I was uh, I also uh, went to the Kent Bog one time. That's off of Route 43 up here in northeastern Ohio, and uh, Kent has a lot of tamarack, blueberry, um, cranberry, also. But I did not see any insect eating plants, so that was the reason for my question. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, these are both bog environments, but you know their plant life does vary, um, I guess, significantly. Yeah, it's nitrogen all content. Yeah, I think it's all going to be a matter of, of you know, which plants established there and, and the, the nuances of the particular plants that are there. And so, yeah, it's a good question as to which bogs, for example, have more insectivorous plants like sundews and pitcher plants. And, uh, and, yes. uh, and uh, you know, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure that there are nuances to that. One of the neat things about the Kent bog, everybody should get over there, uh, especially in the fall when the tamarack. So tamarack, the, uh, the American larch is, has another name called tamarack. So uh, Larix, gosh, I always get this a little bit mixed up. Larix, so there's a, a number of different species of Larix. There's, you know, because there's Japanese larches, European larch. I think European larch is Larix decidua. 
the, the uh, American larch or tamarack, which is not tamarisk. Tamarisk is a completely different plant, but the, the uh, I think that's Larix laricina, but I'm not sure. So anyway, the it's the it's a, a supposedly the southernmost uh, the southernmost natural uh, occurrence of tamaracks in. Uh, not just in Ohio, but I think in the Eastern United States. Oh. So, uh, you know, there's obviously larches and American larches that are planted and they're able to tolerate places other than bogs, though they do love moisture. But, uh, but in terms of a natural, uh, a natural colony of tamaracks, that's the southernmost that we see. And it's, it is a great place, isn't it? I mean, and if you oh, go there, well, I mean, what Chris is talking about is these uh, deciduous conifers. So when we talk about conifers, as we started our talk this evening with, I mean, conifers have cones. We're, you know, we know what a cone is and they have needles. Uh, and so, you know, but some, but we, so sometimes people would say they're evergreens. Well, they're not all evergreens because there are deciduous conifers. So they're a deciduous conifer is a conifer that has cones and needles but it loses its needles every season. So it's deciduous, like a, you know, an oak tree is deciduous, a maple tree is deciduous, and, and deciduous conifers are deciduous. They lose their needles in the fall. And so they brown and, and they're very beautiful. And uh, our, our uh, deciduous conifers that we have are larches, the, all the different species of larch, which is in the genus Larix. We have taxodium, which is the bald cypress. And so depending on where you go taxonomically, the bald and pond cypresses are in the genus Taxodium. And you have liquid, uh, and you have uh, Meta Sequoia, the Don Redwood, which is not a true redwood, but it's uh, Meta Sequoia, it would be like Sequoia. So Meta Sequoia Don Redwood, which was once in Ohio and the Hudson Bay and the Pacific Northwest of the United States and Idaho. And, and it, it was once here, but uh, it, they all died. And uh, then they were only found in, in China. Uh, and then we brought them back out and then we plant them again now. But that's another deciduous conifer. And then there's a, a plant called Pseudolarix or golden larch, which is an incredible plant. Everybody should put one in your yard. I have one in my yard and even I haven't killed it. So Pseudolarix or, or golden larch has golden color cones. Their cones are golden colored in the fall. So at any rate, uh, Anyway, that the tamaracks in the larches in, in Kent Bog are wonderful, but you know that'll be interesting. I don't know, if, uh, you know, I don't know if there actually are insectivorous plants there, and we just you didn't see them. I haven't seen them, but I haven't looked that carefully, or, or whether they aren't there for other reasons of what's there, which uh, nutrition wise. I don't know. Good question. Yeah, good question. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Is there any, particular, any particular direction people want me to take? Do you want to just continue with the presentation? Thumbs up. There's one, two. <laughs> All right. Tom, three. Okay. All right. I mean, we can talk on these things forever, yeah. but let's go into a new realm here. So, what I really want to do now is to talk about plants that are plant pathogens. So we would have to start with what is a plant pathogen and plant disease. We talked a little bit about plant disease before, but let's define an infectious plant pathogen. And always remember that when we talk about plant pathogens and plant disease, we're not talking about insects. Insects feed on plants. They do not produce the enzymatic digestion of, of plant materials. They don't cause infections. They're very different. And it's very important to keep that in mind. And you might say, well, you know, you're you know, the, the, this is just a, a small difference. You guys are being anal, this is crazy, but it's really an important difference. The fact of that host parasite relationship inside plant cells causing an infection is really a different ball game. And the fact that all plant pathogens, when they cause infections are invisible to the naked eye. When they cause infections, they're invisible to the naked eye. Now, the, the one example that would be kind of counter to that would be these plants that are plant pathogens. But at the moment of infection, it is a, a, a process that is 
uh, that that propagule of that pathogen causes the infection, a fungal spore, a bacterial cell, a plant parasitic nematode, all the a virus that causes plant disease, you're not going to see the actual infection, the movement of that organism down into the plant, that hostorium that I showed in the initial cover slide, when that's affecting plant cells, you won't be seeing that, which is, makes it really different. You can't say, well, I won't make an application of something to try to prevent this or be aware of it until I see it. Well, you're not going to see it. You're going to see symptoms later. You're not going to see the infection. You might see a pathogen. You might see a fruiting body of a fungus that's big enough that you'll see it, but you won't see when infection is occurring. You will see when, an, when a Japanese beetle is munching on your leaf. So we're not talking about insects here. Okay, living pathogens usually cause disease in plants by disturbing the metabolism of plant cells through enzymes, toxins, growth regulators, other substances they secrete, and by absorbing foodstuffs from the host cells for their own use. That's what makes them a parasite, absorbing foodstuffs from the host cells for their own use. Some pathogens also cause disease by growing and multiplying in the xylem or phloem vessels of plants. So xylem or phloem. Xylem is what's bringing water and minerals up to the top of the plant through uh, from, from the root system. The xylem is that conducting tissue that brings that water and minerals up. Phloem is what takes the food produced by photosynthesis in the leaves and takes it down to the other leaves and to the stems and down eventually to the root. So there are plant pathogens that tap into that xylem or phloem, uh, and that's, for example, these mistletoes, they tap into that xylem or phloem, and then they take things from it. They take away water, minerals, and foodstuffs. They take away the carbohydrates that photosynthesis has been produced. <clears throat> so those are definitions from the, uh, one of the basic texts, Plant Pathology by George Agrios. This is just an example that gives you a sense of smallness. So this is a powdery mildew fungus on a rose leaf. And so you look at this and you say, no, wait a minute. So these are cells, the uh, epidermal cells of a rose leaf. And then you're looking, what the heck are these things? And these are spores of a powdery mildew fungus. And you might say, well, I've seen powdery mildew and they don't look like this. Well, they do look like this. If you were looking under a microscope at the proper time, they actually are these chains of spores and then there's strands of the fungus. And then they have a way and that they're ostoria from getting down into the <laughs> cells of the plant. This other picture that I've got here is of a really unusual plant pathogen called Plasmodiophora brassicae. And so that's its Latin name. And it's a protist. It's a little uh, one cell organism, or it's actually a cluster of cells that are not uh, clustered into tissue, into a tissue. They're just a bunch of cells that are together. <laughs> and they're called some type of slime mold. And they're plugging up a vascular system, which, and they cause a disease which in modern parlance is called club root of crucifers, crucifers being the mustard family. Uh, it used to be called cabiturnia, which is a much better name. Cabiturnia was a great name. All right, in general, a plant becomes diseased when it is continuously disturbed by some causal agent, some type of pathogen resulting in an abnormal physiological process that disrupts the plant's normal structure, growth, function, or other activities. This interference with one or more of a plant's essential physiological or biochemical systems elicits characteristic pathological conditions or symptoms. Symptoms are what you then see, the rotting of the potato from the potato late blight, the discoloration of tissue from Phytophthora uh, cinnamomy on the stem of a tree. Plant disease is defined as the state of local or systemic completely throughout the plant. That's usually those vascular diseases in the xylem or phloem, abnormal physiological functioning of a plant resulting from the continuous prolonged irritation caused by phytopathogenic organisms, plant pathogenic organisms, infectious. Hey, Jim. Jim, yeah. let's, let's take a five minute break. Let everybody get some water and stretch for five minutes. All right. Let's do that. Let's take a five minute break, everybody. All right, wake up, wake up everybody. <laughs> 